Hi there, welcome to our vodcast on genetic mutations. Now, in this vodcast, we're going to talk about how genetic mutations come about in a population. So it's not about human evolution, although we will kind of touch on this a little bit, but we're not going to go into great detail. So don't be fooled by the cover image. Now, typically when people hear mutations or hear the word mutations, it has a negative connotation or a connotation where something is out of the ordinary. And in some cases, yes, that they are. You can see some conditions such as polydactyly, where you have extra fingers or digits rather on your hands. So this gentleman actually has six fingers on his hands. Or you can have a condition known as hypertrichosis, which is excessive hair growth in areas that normally don't grow that much hair. Although we can have these conditions that are not, as we say, normal, mutations can be bad where they can be fatal. However, mutations can also be beneficial, as we'll learn when we get into evolution. Now, just really quickly here, as you may know, humans evolved from a common ancestor. And as a result, over time, that DNA has changed. And because of those changes of the DNA, we started to create different groups based on different characteristics. So we have the Ardipithecus group, and then the Australopithecus group here, the Paranthropus group, and then the Homo group, which we reside in. If you take a look at the groups, you'll notice that overall their characteristics are going to be different from one another. You can actually see the evolution of humans humans as we are today. But not only if you compare the groups are they different, but if you take a look at the different species within the groups, you'll notice that they're different. And even though you may have differences among species, if you take a look at our own species, you'll have differences amongst us in our own species. So when you look at this group photo, of this diverse group of people, you'll see people who are African American, they're Asian, they're Caucasian, they're Latino, they're Middle Eastern, and so forth. You have all these variations of humans or homo sapiens as we are. And the reason why we look so different is because of the different genetic mutations that have occurred. And those mutations aren't bad because they're still in the gene pool and they make us who we are. So a genetic mutation is basically a permanent change in the DNA. Now it could be in the DNA strand itself or it can be in the number of chromosomes. So we're gonna take a look at two types. We're gonna take a look at chromosomal alterations and we're gonna take a look at gene mutations. Now we'll start off with chromosomal alterations here. Now chromosomal alteration basically changes the numbers of the chromosomes in a cell from a process called non-disjunction. Okay, non-disjunction is going to be where we have either homologous pairs, like we do in meiosis one, or chromatid pairs, as we do in meiosis two, well, they're gonna to fail to separate like they should in anaphase. So when they fail to separate, then we start to throw the numbers off a little bit. And because of this failed separation, we can cause conditions such as Down syndrome, which is known as trisomy 21, which we'll get to a little bit later. And then also we can have a condition of polyploidy, which will give extra sets or half sets of chromosomes, and they could be written as 3N or 4N or greater than that, depending on how many sets are in the cell, versus the normal 2N for diploid and then N for haploid cells of we that we've been going by. So let's take a look at how this all works in non-disjunction. All right, so again, non-disjunction is a failure of separation between either homologous or sister chromatid pairs during meiosis. So here we have normal meiosis, okay? We have our normal cell here. That's our original cell that's going to divide to make sex cells. It's going to replicate the chromosomes. They're going to line up in the middle metaphase. And now here we are in anaphase being pulled apart. And then the homologous pairs separate here. Chromatid pairs get separated here. And then we go from our, four, our 2N number of four chromosomes to our haploid N number of two chromosomes. So this is normal division. This is what's supposed to happen. But sometimes things don't happen the way they're supposed to. Now, this is what non-disjunction looks like. Same setup, original diploid number, four chromosomes, they've replicated, they've met in the middle in metaphase, and now they're being separated in anaphase. But in non-disjunction, that doesn't happen. The top two chromosomes, they are separated normally. This is how it's supposed to happen. But if you take a look below, you'll notice that the homologous pairs are stuck together. They are not moving to the opposite poles of the cell like they normally should in anaphase one. And as a result, that's going to throw the numbers off for the cells in meiosis two. So where we had four total chromosomes here, since we had the extra chromosomes set from the homologous pairs, 
we're actually going to have six chromosomes. And when this cell divides, we're going to create a gamete or a sex cell that has three total chromosomes. Since this part of the homologous pair went to that cell, then that means this cell only had one chromosome to split apart. And as a result, we're going to get our single chromosome. So when you take a look at the writing here, you're going to see n plus 1. So n is the haploid number, which is 2. And then since we have a third chromosome, that's the plus 1. The haploid number here would normally be 2, but we have one less. So it's written as n minus 1. So that's how non-disjunction can affect the chromosome development or production, rather, when it happens in meiosis 1. But it can also happen in meiosis 2. So when we take a look at non-disjunction in meiosis 2, it's the same setup. We have normal meiosis here, as we went over, and now we have non-disjunction in meiosis 2. What happens in non-disjunction in meiosis 2 is this. Meiosis, the meiotic division rather, occurs normally in meiosis 1. Homologous pairs line up in metaphase, they get pulled apart in anaphase, and each half of the pair goes to the opposite side of the cell and get placed into a new cell. So everything is good up until this point. In this cell where normal meiotic divisions are happening, the chromatid pairs are being separated and then they're being placed into the sex cell. However, if non-disjunction, again, the failure to separate the chromatid pairs happens in meiosis 2, you're going to get an imbalance or an uneven number of chromosomes. So this one chromosome will go to the left and these two chromatid pairs will also go to the left creating a three chromosome gamete. And this will, since it's less one or does not have the other chromatid pair that it should, it's going to have one. This is how non-disjunction affects the chromosomal numbers because normal meiotic division would give us two chromosomes in this scenario. Well, the numbers have been altered. They've been changed. There's more genetic information going into the cells. So that's a chromosomal alteration. So let's take a look at what happens when these gametes meet each other and create a zygote. So at the top here, we have normal fertilization. We have your regular normal haploid gametes, and they form our normal diploid number. But what can happen is you can have your non-disjunction gamete that's missing a chromosome and then fuse with the egg to form a zygote that's actually one less the diploid. Here, we can have non-disjunction where we have the extra chromosome placed in the gamete and is going to fertilize the egg. And then as a result, what you'll see is you'll have a normal pair here, but then you're going to get a group of three chromosomes that are the same. So this is actually what's called trisomy. Tri means three and somi or soma means body. So this actually means three bodies. And that's what exactly it looks like. And there's certain conditions that can happen because of this. Now this is what's called a karyotype. A karyotype is basically a photograph of all the different chromosomes and in their pair arrangements. So as we know, we have 46 chromosomes. That means we have 23 pairs, okay, pair 22, and then this is the 23rd pair. Pairs 1 through 22 are your autosomal chromosomes, and then pair 23 is your sex chromosomes, which determines your gender, XY being male and then XX being female. Now, when you do these karyotypes, you can determine whether a baby's going to have trisomy in their chromosomal makeup. In Edwards syndrome, you, you can have trisomy 18, where you have three chromosomes on chromosome pair 18. Patau syndrome, you have trisomy 13 here, so you have three chromosomes on 13. And remember that polydactyl guy, this guy? Well, it's believed polydactyl can be caused because of trisomy 13. And then here we have Klinefelter syndrome, where we actually have an extra chromosome on the sex chromosome pair. And this is actually two X's, two X chromosomes and a Y. But the example that we talked about was Down syndrome. So this is what a karyotype of Down syndrome looks like. As we said, trisomy 21 is the name for Down syndrome. So if you look at chromosome pair 21, you'll see three chromosomes there. All right, so hence the name trisomy 21. So that's trisomy 20, uh, 21, and that's non-disjunction in meiosis. Now, when I talked about non-disjunction earlier, I also mentioned a condition called polyploidy. So let's take a look at that. Polyploidy, if you might remember from the beginning of the year, we talked about prefixes like mono meaning one, like monosaccharide, di meaning two, like disaccharide. And then we talked about poly, which is three or more. Uh, like in polysaccharides. Well, polyploidy is going to be three or more sets of chromosomes. What happens again is this. Here we have normal meiosis. Again, our homologous pairs are broken up. 
Our chromatid pairs are then broken up, creating our normal haploid sex cells. But in polyploidy, when non-disjunction happens, nothing gets broken up. The homologous pairs meet in the middle and they both, they all get pulled or some of them get pulled to one side of the cell. So in this example, we have both homologous pairs being pulled to the left side of the cell, which means when the cell divides, it's going to create a new cell that's still basically a clone of the original cell. But that means there's nothing in this cell. There's no chromosomal information here. And then as a result, what's going to happen is this cell will divide and then it will create our two end gametes. So we have four chromosomes here, we have four chromosomes there, same number as we had here. So now our gametes, instead of being half the number, are the full set. And this is how this all works out. When you have a polyploid gamete meet up with a normal gamete, you're going to get an extra set of chromosomes. So this is what's called 3N, okay? So if you think about it, 2N, plus n, which is really like 1n, will equal 3n. So here's your 2n or your diploid chromosomes, and here's that half set that was given by the other gamete. But sometimes you can actually have two polyploidy gametes form, and then your two polyploidy gametes, again, we're talking about sets of chromosomes. So we have 2n and 2n here. We're going to get our complete set of 4n, and this becomes 4n polyploidy. And it doesn't stop at 4n. It can go up to higher numbers than that based on how many chromosomes are in there. So if you take a look at this diagram here, here's a list of the different polyploidy foods that you eat. And on this list, you'll notice things like bananas and strawberries. So that's how non-disjunction alters the chromosomal makeup of our cell. Now let's go back to our concept map and talk about gene mutations. Now gene mutations are the ones that you're probably more familiar with. This is where we actually alter parts or sequences in the DNA. So this occurs when nitrogen bases adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine are changed. And they're changed, or the order is changed, either one of three ways. One, we can have substitution. Two, we can have deletion. And three, we can have insertion. So all of these occur in the nitrogen bases on the DNA strand. All right, substitution is when one base is replaced or switched out by another base, kind of like in sports. If you get subbed out, someone comes in for you. Deletion, Again, if you delete something on a Word document or a Google Doc, you're removing it. So in deletion, a base gets removed. Insertion is when a base is added. So let's take a look at how this works. So at the top here, we have our original DNA sequence. We have three adenines and thymine pairs, cytosine and guanine pairs, and then we have guanine and cytosine pairs. We're gonna concentrate on the middle section or this group of three. So when we take a look, we want to compare the numbers of the nitrogen bases and whether the same bases are there. So we see that we have our cytosine guanine, we see we have our cytosine guanine here, and the third one is gone. And in its place is the adenine thymine. So since this base got switched out for that base, this mutation is called a substitution. Well, you might be looking at this one and say, how come this isn't a substitution? Because you want to look at the rest of the bases. We have our first cytosine guanine pair, we have our second cytosine guanine pair, and then we have a third one. So the three original bases are still there, they've just been moved or split up because we've added an adenine thymine base pair. So that's an insertion mutation. And then in this one, you'll notice that we have two cytosine guanine pairs and the third one is gone. It's been removed. So because it's been removed, it's been deleted. And that's our deletion mutation. So let's take a look and see how this can affect us. So one example that we're going to look at here is this. We're going to take a look at a condition called sickle cell anemia. And it's a condition that affects the, the red blood cells. So let's take a look at what we have. Here we have our DNA strand. And as we learned in protein synthesis, we make our mRNA. So here's our messenger RNA and the, and the three base codes for each amino acid, the codons. So this is the protein sequence or the amino acid sequence to make the protein for a normal red blood cell. But if we take a look at this middle section here, this guanine, cytosine, adenine, thymine, adenine, thymine in combination, and we take a look down here, well, we have our guanine, cytosine, but instead of an adenine, thymine, we have a thymine, adenine. And then we have our original adenine, thymine. So this base here got substituted. Okay, there wasn't an extra base added. There wasn't one removed. We just switched this base pair out with that base pair out. And as you know, instead of having uracil in your messenger RNA, you now have adenine in your messenger RNA, which then codes for a different amino acid. Well, if you have a different amino acid, as you may remember, you have a different protein. 
And as a result, this is what a sickle cell anemic red blood cell looks like. As you can see, the shape of it is drastically different from the normal red blood cell. The red blood cell is round, so it can fit through our round tubular capillaries, but the sickle cell red blood cell is pointed at the ends. So this is going to cause a problem because it can get stuck and then uh, start blood clotting. The shape of the, of the sickle cell blood cell also reduces the amount of surface area or the size of it. So it's going to carry less oxygen than the red, normal red blood cell. So individuals with sickle cell anemia may become fatigued a little bit faster than the people that don't have it. So that wraps up our vodcast on gene mutations. We have our whole chromosome, chromosomal alteration mutations caused by non-disjunction. And then we have our single gene mutations caused by the deletion, substitution, or insertion of base pairs. That wraps up our vodcast. Thank you for your time.